and today we are reading chapter 8 of Absolutely Truly. Water is my natural element. At least, that's what my father always says. He says that I was swimming practically before I learned how to walk. Mom says I did a cannonball in the baptismal font, which I know is a Texas tall tale, but I'm never quite sure about the one she tells about bath time. She says I used to get so excited splashing around in the tub that she had to put floaties on my arms. What I know for sure is that I've always loved the feeling of being in water. Plus, it doesn't matter where you live or how often you move. There's always a pool, and the water is always the same. Water doesn't care how tall you are either. And right now, I couldn't wait to dive back in. Swimmers on the block, shouted the coach, and my toes curled automatically over the edge of the starting block. The, the 50 freestyle was the first of several hurdles here at tryouts that would determine whether I'd become a member of the Pumpkin Falls youth swim team. I just hoped I wasn't too out of shape from not having been in the water for several weeks. Take your mark. I moved into the track start position, placing one foot behind me and grabbing the block on either side of my forward leg, focused like a hawk on its prey as I waited. At the sound of a buzzer, I arched forward, launching myself into the air. For a brief moment, I heard the shouts and the cheers of onlookers from the bleachers, and then the water closed over my head and the world fell away. A current of pure joy cursed through my body. Swimming is probably as close as I'll ever get to flying. As for being out of shape, I needn't have worried. It's like I'd never been away. I quickly fell into the familiar rhythm as my arms and legs sliced through the water, and I hit my pace just after a few strokes. A quick flip turn at the end of my lane, push off and glide, and I was in the home stretch. I cranked up the tempo, pouring it on until I practically flew in the last few yards. I slapped the edge of the pool and glanced up at the clock. Not my best time, but not bad either, especially if you considered the fact that I hadn't been in the water since we moved to New Hampshire. Plus, I was the first one at the wall by a long shot. The coach looked at me in surprise over the top of his clipboard. I wasn't expecting that. I smiled. No one ever is. The thing is, I don't necessarily look like a jock. Most people figure girls my age who are as tall as I am would have feet as big as mine, helpful my brother is, Hatcher calls them flippers, are uncoordinated. Like maybe we've sprouted too fast or something. Although I'm not always super graceful, especially not on the dance floor, I'm not a total klutz either. But put me in the water and it's like my body has found its reason for existence. You've got mermaid DNA, dad used to tell me. I glanced over at the bleachers and waved at him. He gave me a brief two finger salute in return. Aunt True was next to him with Pippa and Lauren. She'd sprung them from after school care so they could come watch. Well, Pippa was watching. Lauren had her nose in a book, as usual. Cha-Cha and Jasmine had come to cheer Lucas and me on, and my mother was going to try and make it for the last bit too. She had a late afternoon history class with Professor Rusty. Danny and Hatcher were both at wrestling practice. Go truly, my aunt shouted. I grinned at her and hauled myself out of the pool. Grabbing my towel from a nearby bench, I looked over to where the next batch of hopefuls were lining up. Lucas Winthrop was among them. Lucas was in a swimsuit, and he was not a sight for sore eyes. Skinny as a whistle, pale as milk, it was easily the sorriest excuse for a seventh grader I'd ever seen. He had determination, though. When the coach blew his whistle, Lucas was the first one in the water, and if he turned his way across the pool with more grit than grace, he'd still ended up in a respectable time. Way to go, Winthrop! I called and he looked over startled and then smiled. Behind me, some of the moms were talking in the bleachers. Oh, swimming is the perfect sport for Lucas, I heard Mrs. Winthrop say. My son was delicate when he was younger, you know, and contact sports are far too dangerous. Plus, he comes home from the pool so wonderfully clean. Glancing over my shoulder, I saw the other mothers exchange amused looks. Mrs. Winthrop rattled on, oblivious. Maybe Lucas and I had more in common than I thought. The pool was probably the one place he could go to get away from his mom. It was always my refuge, too. Being underwater is the ultimate form of stealth mode. A little while later, I was on the deck again for the 100 individual medley. My mother waved to me from the stands. I was glad she made it in time because the medley was always my favorite race. 25 yards each of butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle. Let's see what you can do, said Coach Maynard. At the sound of the bell, I dove in, launching myself a few inches below the surface of the water into a streamline propelled by a mighty dolphin kick. Every muscle in my body zinged as I surged forward. The butterfly is my favorite stroke. 
I love that split second when I lunge out of the water and I'm almost airborne. It feels like flying. Thinking about flying made me think of my father. Would he be able to pilot a helicopter or plane again someday? Not commercially. He'd explain to us why that was out, but just for fun? I knew how much he hated being grounded. It was probably the same for him as not swimming was for me. I couldn't imagine not ever being able to swim again. I would feel like a bird without wings. I finished the medley not too far off my own personal best time. When I got out of the pool, Coach Maynard shook my hand. Welcome to the team, truly, he said. I don't need to see any more. Stick around for the rest of tryouts if you want, but I'll expect you here starting tomorrow afternoon. We practice every day from four until six. I nodded happily. Glancing up in the stands again, I gave my family and friends an exuberant thumbs up. Then I headed to the dressing room to shower and change. Congratulations, honey, my mother said a little while later when I emerged. She gave me a big hug. Not that I had any doubt. Thanks, mom. My father gave me an awkward squeeze. I expected no less from a love joy, he said. This was high praise coming from the silent man, and I practically floated to the parking lot. Outside, snow was falling thick and fast. Can you believe this? Aunt True marveled. It's like something out of a Russian novel. I swear, I don't ever remember a winter like this when we were growing up, do you, JT? My father shook his head. Mom turned her face up to the sky and closed her eyes. Do you remember that part in Anna Karina? Karenina? You mean when Aunt True began? Yes. Wasn't that incredibly? Oh, totally. Tolstoy the best. Aunt True and Mom are soulmates when it comes to books. They speak in this weird literary shorthand that none of us really understand. Would you guys mind if I walk home? I asked, spotting Cha-Cha and Jasmine emerge from the swim center. The pumpkin falls, private eye, needed to talk. No, not at all, said my mother, sliding into the driver's seat of her minivan. My sister's climbing in the back. Are you coming, JT, or are you heading back to the bookshop? I should head to the bookshop, he told her. The accountant's dropping by in a bit to go over the end of the day, end of the month financials. I'll keep you company, Santa said Aunt True, linking her arm through his good one. And just because you're my favorite brother, I'll even make you dinner. My mother laughed. Now there's an offer you can't refuse. I'll see you later then. And she waved at us and drove off. I said goodbye to my father and my aunt, then headed over to find Chacha and Jasmine, who disappeared around the corner of the swimming center. I followed and quickly came upon Calhoun stuffing snow down the neck of Lucas Winthrop's jacket again, while Jasmine and, Cal Jasmine and Cha Cha tried to stop him. I ran over to help. Knock it off, Romeo, I hollered. Calhoun froze. I did too. I didn't mean to drop the Romeo bomb that way. Once again, big foot in my mouth. Cha Cha and Jasmine and Lucas gaped at us. Romeo? said Cha Cha. Who's Romeo? I pointed right at Calhoun. Your name is Romeo? Calhoun's face flamed red. I always wondered what the R and RJ stood for, said Jasmine. I figured the J was for James like your dad, but I never would have guessed R for Romeo. Calhoun abruptly let go of Lucas's jacket. I'm out of here, he muttered. Thinking quickly, I realized that I could actually use this to my advantage. Uh, no, actually you're not, I told him. I've had to put up with your truly gigantic and truly drooly for weeks now. You can deal with Romeo. Which, I added, we won't tell a soul about on one condition. He regarded me warily. Quit picking on Lucas. And while you're at it, see if you can get Scooter to stop picking on him too. And on me. Calhoun lifted a shoulder and then gave a reluctant nod. Good. Your secret's safe with us. You promise? He asked, darting a glance at me. Cross my heart and hope to... My voice trailed off. <laughs> Whatever. Our lips are sealed. Sealed, said Cha-Cha, holding up three fingers in the traditional Boy Scout salute. Then her dimple appeared and she grinned broadly. Scott Sounder, Romeo. I grinned back. Guess what? I told my friends. I think I have a plan on how to get to the top of the church steeple. That's the end of chapter 28, and we finally saw the information about Romeo go to good use. So tell me, what happened in the chapter? What sort of thoughts or inferences do you have for the next chapter? How do you feel about this chapter?